quite similar. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Lucy. Um, and thank you very much to the organisers for uh, inviting me to speak at this gathering. Um, you've all seemed to last the day quite well. The crowd is still here. Um, in some respects, I feel like the person that's been talked about all day um, <laughs> and by some quirk of planning has the last right of response to all that. Um, uh, but let me reassure you, I I'm actually not going to rehearse every point that's been made about Texa today um, uh, by the various speakers through the day, rightly, wrongly, factually or inaccurately, as they may variously have been. Um, uh, we have, as a commission, um, took a, taken a very early view of all of that, and I'm not going to um, go, go back over our decision not to be um, chasing our tail with respect to uh, correcting things that have been said um, or reinterpreting things that, that have been said by various folk in the sector. Um, what I do want to focus on for the next 15 minutes or so is, is um, a picture of the future um, that um, we have um, sought to... Let me just get the PowerPoint up so I can speak to it. Um, a picture of the future that um, we, we wish to and have commenced a di dialogue with the sector about um, that goes to issues about regulatory practice um, uh, and, and the way in which we see the future unfolding for that in the months and years ahead. Um, so I'm going to focus on that with respect to the presentation part of, of this half hour and, and certainly to the extent there are things you want to revisit with respect to questions raised or questions you want to put to me, then by all means use the remainder of the session to do that and I'll do my very, very best to answer those for you. Um, we have announced uh, in the last uh, month or so, having, having forecast that we would announce reforms um, some time before that, um, but formally on the 4th of October, 3rd of October, we, we announced uh, a package of reforms to our provider constituency at a provider information session here in Melbourne um, that, uh, that ch charted a way forward for regulatory reform as it's practised by us over the coming months. And I wanted to um, share with you um, the essential components of that uh, and give you a chance then to, to uh, ask questions about it. Um, in many respects, it reflects quite strongly on a lot of comments that have been made through the course of today. And certainly one of the things that I found a little refreshing um, um, earlier in the day was Bill Scales' um, discussion with folk that, that gave um, a reminder to people about, about the origins of TEXA um, and, and precisely the reasons why it was established um, as, a, as part of a um, comprehensive package of reforms that the Bradley Review articulated. Um, TEXA took quite a while to get to the starting gate after the Bradley Review and, and there's a whole history that attaches to that and certainly I had um, some part in the establishment of the agency um, prior to the passing of the legislation and, of course, the formation of the Commission. Um, but nevertheless, Bill's account of all of that in the context of other policy drivers that, that were the subject of attention through Bradley um, was, I think, a, a refreshing re reminder to people about where Texa came from and what it was about. Um, having said that, our, the, the reform agenda that we've proposed um, is informed by a number of things that have occurred since our establishment. Um, and I'll just remind you all that Texa became the regulator something like 21 months ago. Um, that seems to, on some days at Texa to be a long time ago, and at other days it only seems like yesterday. Um, but nevertheless, it is the case that only 20 months, one months ago, um, the regulatory power switched on. And indeed, some of our powers to do with ESOS uh, and the regulation of international education under that Act occurred even more recently than that. Um, in the time we've been the regulator, though, we've conducted re-registrations on eight universities, two other self-accrediting providers, and multiple higher ed providers, uh, typically that are members of Clare Fields' organisation, ACPET, or Adrian McCombs' organisation at COFI. Um, 
that has given us um, some significant experience of, of the application of threshold standards to the work of the regulator in determining registration and the accreditation of courses under, under those standards. It's important that people understand that before January 2012, no one had done that work. No one had ever had to apply those standards to any regulatory context at all. So there was no history. Um, and indeed, at the point at which the Commission came together in October 2011, th there was actually no precedent from which we were to work. We had a blank piece of paper, we had an Act, we had a set of threshold standards, and we had to frame the basis on which we applied those standards. We also, under the Act, had to observe its provisions, including the important language that we had to be satisfied that providers we registered had met the threshold standards. Now, we did inherit some information from states and territories. Um, that was incomplete. Some states and territories, for different reasons, um, decided they couldn't hand over their regulatory records to us. Um, so the historical record that we inherited was, to say the least, patchy. Um, and certainly, as Claire indicated earlier in the day, the practice of regulation at state and territory levels was variable. Ostensibly, they were operating under the same set of protocols and supposedly applying the same set of rules, but their state-based legislation was, um, in important aspects, different. And certainly, the way in which regulators interpreted those provisions across the states and territories was distinctly variable and different. Um, so for all that, we had um, an interesting set of challenges, um, sometimes informed by history, but mostly requiring us to make our own starting point with respect to a fresh regulatory regime under a new act, a new set of standards, and the way in which we interpreted those was uh, a blank piece of paper at the time we c came together. So having done the... Um, the, the re-registration work we did in our first 12 to 18 months, um, we armed ourselves through that process um, with a, a set of historical records, decisions taken and fresh data collected that enabled us to approach the reform agenda we've announced in recent weeks um, for the consideration of the sector. And it's that history of 18 months of regulation that by and large has informed the way in which the approach we've developed and proposed to the sector to, to discuss uh, has, has been developed. Um, since that time, we've had the review report from Down Braithwaite, uh, and we've now most recently had a direction from the Minister, um, the, the second direction we've had from any Minister in our time together um, as an agency. Um, and those two things have helped refine and nuance the way in which we've shaped the discussion paper that's now out for public consultation. And of course there are two documents in that, in that process. One is about regulatory process, substantially both for purposes of registration and the accreditation of courses. And the second one is about the regulatory risk framework and ways in which um, we would seek now, on the basis of our experience, to reform that that framework for purpose, purposes of application to the regulatory environment. Um, so with that history, um, what are we trying to achieve? Well, certainly we're trying to achieve and recognise the need to reduce the regulatory burden that applies to all providers in our system. Um, we're also trying to accelerate decision-making timeframes, and we recognise the need to do that for all providers in the system. Um, and I might say, as a general comment, um, we by and large have already done things more quickly than the former state and territory regulators were able to achieve during their uh, lengthy period with responsibility in these areas. And I make that comment to you on the, on the basis of my long association with state and territory regulators prior to becoming involved in the TEXA process. We are seeking and have achieved, I think, significant reduction in information and reporting requirements. Um, at the start of Texas life, there was no provision that enabled the Commonwealth to share with Texas 
in fact its portfolio agency, um, data from the Heems collection, for example. Um, that led us to need to require information to be provided to us in the first provider information request um, in 2012. Um, and it was only through that process that we were able to generate interest in the Commonwealth amending its Higher Ed Support Act and giving us, um, by deed of the amendments to the Act, a capacity to look directly at the HEMS data that is collected. Now, the result of that collective initiative has been um, uh, a development which, which means universities don't have to provide any data to us fundamentally at all. Um, and a number of Table B providers are in a similar position because of what they already provide through the HEMS system. But it's certainly the case, as many private providers in the room will know, that, that much data is, that compares with the university collections is not collected routinely among private providers. And certainly there is an added obligation on, on the part of those providers in that category to provide information to us. But we have stripped out, by and large, much of the things that um, we would otherwise like to know and focused quite expressly on the things we need to know for purposes of applying that information to compliance with the standards framework. They broadly go to student performance data issues, staffing information, um, financial information and financial performance data. And the third one, the fourth one, um, which is a, a category of um, information we sought initially to do was student survey data, data about what students are actually um, saying about their experience in, in your providers. Now, it's that fourth one that we're, we've moved away from because of the non-standard form in which, uh, in which those, that, that type of category of data is, is presented, uh, but it's nevertheless of interest to us as to what you know to be the, the feedback you get from your student constituencies about th their experience in your providers, whether they're universities or, or other higher ed providers in our system. Um, we are seeking to get greater acknowledgement of history and performance of providers through risk profiles. We've done one full round of risk assessments that have given us a now comprehensive baseline of information and, and perspective on, on the risks that are applying to your various operational um, circumstances. Um, and we're now in the mode of the second collection of data and information collection, um, as I indicated earlier. Um, that is giving us a baseline that enables us with confidence to know that we can now nuance the regulatory approaches and the regulatory um, uh, strategies we deploy for different providers to, to customise that process um, to, to the evidence we have before us. From day one, that evidence didn't, was not in our hands and we had no basis for doing other than um, a full look at the way in which each provider um, establishes its um, performance and credentials against all of the threshold standards. Um, we are seeking to balance, therefore, the benefits of regulation with the consequential burden that attaches to it for individual providers. There's been some talk today about large providers and small providers variously having disproportionate impact on their, on their operational circumstances as a courtesy of the regulator. And we're cognizant of that. Um, the elements of risk that attach to the providers in those various circumstances are, are important to us and, and relate quite directly to the way in which we do assess risk in the context of risk to the sector and and risk to the sector's reputation internationally. So they are the focus of our, of our, um, of our reform agenda, as is um, the notion of continuous improvement, um, which I've noted Jan's comments from earlier um, in this session, um, and, and perhaps there's something that we can talk about in the Q&A afterwards, but, um, but we are certainly interested in continuous improvement as it relates to providers in all categories of um, performance in, within the sector, um, new and old, um, for-profit and not-for-profit, small and large, dual sector or single sector in operating circumstances. Um, what does this mean for um, providers? Well, as a, as a critical dimension, more differentiation between initial registration and the re-registration process. 
Um, and this is not unrelated to Richard James' uh, comments about the revisions to the standards earlier in the day. Um, he talked about, and we have always endorsed as a commission, the notion that standards should be outcomes focused. But it is important to recognise the purposes to which standards are applied within the regulatory context that include the need for them to be used as the point of judgement about new entrants to the system that have no outcomes to report to the regulator, none at all. Um, what we have to deal with uh, in those circumstances are things like inputs, processes and promises, by and large. A, a provider with no track record approaching registration for the first time has to present its case in terms of all those three things, but almost certainly they have nothing in the outcomes column to offer us by way of support for their application. Um, now that contrasts obviously quite directly with the position of the 172 providers on our register um, who all have history in the sector, who all have outcomes to report um, and, and who by and large um, are increasingly able to reflect on those on, on outcomes and history as they relate to particular standards within the framework. I'm sure that won't diminish as time goes on, but it does cast in stark contrast the circumstances the regulator has to deal with for new versus old and re-registering providers. Track record is an important dimension to our, to our purpose and, and we understand that. Um, we don't uniformly have history that predates the beginning of 2012. Uh, that's the reality of the, life, uh, of the environment in which we, we have to operate. Um, but we are increasingly developing a depth of knowledge about all of our providers and all of their contexts and operating circumstances. And that's an important dimension of the way in which we approach the, re the reform agenda. Um, the last dimension about process really is our intent to introduce a dialogue with providers using the case management model that um, has been commented on um, through the day earlier, um, to set the agenda for a re-registration process where that uh, is in prospect for any provider. So part of the process would be a kick-off point where a dialogue with TEXA through the case manager um, was, under was undertaken. Essentially, the balancing act we're trying to achieve here is illustrated by this diagram, which talks about lower scrutiny being the purview of those providers with a sound history, no significant risks that go to their operating circumstances, um, and, and no or very, very few compliance problems, versus those providers who might have um, significant um, compliance issues that have been a feature of their their operating circumstances in the early part of their time in the sector or in their dialogue with us. Um, significant risks are evident through the assessment process of, of the risk through the risk framework um, and whose history is quite limited or who, whose history th is, is longer but problematic in the context of, of their operating circumstances. Um, but as you'd expect, providers build a history with a regulator and it's through that building of history that we grow in confidence as a regulator and the provider grows in confidence with respect to their relationship with us that enables us to take a much more nuanced approach to the way in which providers are, are dealt with through regulation and accreditation. Um, can I deal with now what we're conceiving as things that are core to every provider's um, regulatory experience with us? And you'll see immediately that the list is relatively small and focuses on specific standards um, that, as they exist now in the current threshold standards. Um, two broad categories of interest for us are about capacity to self-assure through things like governance um, and academic quality assurance within, an, within a provider. And this goes to whether a provider is self-accrediting or not, frankly. Um, it, it doesn't for example, change necessarily the fact that we think these factors, these threshold issues are, are critically important to the standing of the provider in our sector. And of course, the, the second dimension is about student outcomes. What are the measures of student performance and student success that give the regulator confidence 
that this is a provider achieving the objectives it sets out for itself and, uh, and can measure and reflect on those, those outcomes itself as it builds and improves the quality of its operations. Around that core might be a whole other number of different threshold standards. Um, that might be quite distinct for particular providers um, but, uh, and, and quite different even to the four that are specifically mentioned in the grey ring around this dialogue diagram. Um, but commonly we'll be interested in issues around financial sustainability um, and, and that goes to, to both small and large providers. Um, but often the small ones have a fragility about their financial position which, which gives us reason to want to have a dialogue with them in an ongoing way about, about their financial performance. Um, third party uh, arrangements which you know was the subject of a of a survey we undertook earlier in the year and which will be the subject of a national report um, probably in the early part of 2014 um, looms significantly among high risk issues for many of our providers. Even in the narrow fields of teaching and learning that we focused on with respect to that survey, more than half the sector uh, is exposed to third party arrangements in that space and, and in many respects um, the levels of engagement on third parties are growing in number um, uh, both nationally and internationally. Um, so that gives you a conceptual idea of the core that we might focus on and those things around the core that might be added to it where the provider circumstances justify um, the, the regulator's attention. Um, that attention might be driven by the risk assessment, by regulatory history uh, or by the dialogue we've had on other aspects of our relationship with providers, for example, through um, the material change mechanism which requires um, where the onus is on the provider um, to report challenges they are facing as they relate to threshold standards and the potential for those standards to be breached in circumstances where the provider has, has problems that it is seeking to address. Um, our reforms do not stop with um, revisions to the way regulation and course accreditation are practised across the system. Um, we have um, taken, as I think um, uh, Kwong Lee um, alluded to earlier in the, in the, the afternoon, um, steps to reduce the number of risk factors that we're, we're looking at through a revision of our risk assessment framework. Our experience of this over the first full cycle of assessments is that um, a number of the factors we had among the 46 um, were not able to be populated with meaningful data, so they became in evidence quite, quite redundant in terms of our consideration of risks. But we equally found areas of overlap between some of the factors, and particularly as they relate to financial assessments and financial sustainability, um, we've taken a quite different approach to the way in which instead of highlighting particular factors, we're looking at developing a suite of things that lead us to, to draw a financial profile of each provider. Um, but as, as was said, um, the number of factors that, that drive the risk assessment um, framework into the future is likely to be of the order of a dozen. Uh, again, this is out for consultation and we're open to all, all sorts of suggestions from providers about, about the appropriateness of that. Um, we're also seeking some movement about the alignment of regulatory processes. Um, and there has been some allusion to this, but let me give you a, a critical example. As you know, the regulatory cycle under Texas framework is um, uh, gives the potential for a seven year cycle of events, regulatory events with us. Seven years for regulation, re registration, seven years for courses to be accredited. Um, the ESOS Act remains at the maximum a five year cycle. Uh, we would certainly like to see regulatory um, legislative reform that enabled those two acts to speak to each other on the same time frame uh, uh, for purposes at least of higher education reg re regulation. Uh, the obvious solution is to um, allow higher ed providers a seven year cycle so that regulatory events can be aligned in a way that enables a single event to deliver multiple outcomes for, um, for providers. 
Um, we're also narrowing the sense of burden providers have had about material change. This was a, a mechanism introduced in the Texer Act. Um, it was new to all providers uh, at the time it was introduced. Um, and we've now worked with it for the 18 months or so we have and decided there are ways in which we can reduce the frequency with which um, pro all providers um, are driven to the material change mechanism to report something to us. Um, this will reduce the numbers of, of, of times that's required under the legislation uh, and give us scope to have a dialogue informally with providers about, about the nature of any changes that are material to their circumstances um, and certainly take away the formality of that process as it relates um, to the process articulation we started with. Um, it hasn't changed the obligation on providers to maintain their slice of responsibility for, for reporting things to, to the regulator. But it has reconceptualised that responsibility to a less formal, um, more dialogue-based set of arrangements, which enable you, for example, simply to ring up the phone and report something to your case manager as a way of reflecting on um, um, what you might want to report to us. Um, annual data collections are now reduced in scale and for some providers, particularly those that report under Table A, Table B of, of the HESER Act, um, quite, uh, um, quite reduced in burden. And we've said now for some time that the quality assessments we're charged with responsibility for will only occur um, once a year um, unless the Minister directs us to do something quite specific uh, for him where um, that may change. Um, we are working with a number of other bodies. There's been some talk, for example, of the ASQA um, Texa dialogue that uh, we've initiated and had ongoing now for something like 18 months with some important um, developments. We're equally engaged with a number of international bodies who have regulatory responsibility in jurisdictions where, t where Australian providers have a particular uh, level of activity. Um, the four that we have signed up that, that cover this territory are the QAA agency in the UK, um, but perhaps re more regionally focused, the other three are in Malaysia, Singapore and Hong Kong. Um, our dialogue with professional bodies has been um, quite um, extensive over the early months of our existence and they continue. Um, and we have negotiated arrangements where we hope to be able to share course accreditation uh, activities with professional bodies where that's appropriate in order for the provider to turn what would otherwise be at least two regulatory events of different purpose and intent into a single coordinated one. Now sometimes that's not possible but certainly of the 140 professional accrediting bodies um, we think exist out there in the system. Um, we've opened a dialogue with a number of them um, and with, with tribes of them really through Professions Australia um, and our, our progress in that area will target particular disciplines in order to, to seek to achieve models of um, mutual accreditation practice that facilitates and benefits um, providers and reduces their obligations um, uh, uh, for, for both the agencies. Um, I've mentioned the department and our, our wish to see legislative refer reforms um, and I won't rehearse that again. Um, the last slide here is about consulting with our stakeholders and goes to um, the extent to which we are genuinely interested in feedback on the proposals that are out there. The two documents have been on our website now for a couple of weeks. We are engaged in direct bilateral conversations with peak bodies and other stakeholders. Um, we're certainly inviting folk to offer us written um, feedback on, on the material content of each of the documents that are out there and also answers to the questions we've posed through those documents. Um, we certainly expect this consultation to go right through to its prospective closing date of the 4th of December and to the extent there are providers that are struggling to meet a deadline of 4th of December, we're certainly open to the idea that that might extend for purposes of them being able to complete the assignment and give us the benefit of their views on what we've proposed. I should stop there, Lucy, and let, uh, let the Q&A um, 
take yes, over. Yes, thank you very much, Ian. That was really informative. And um, I think a lot of people have probably already um, been looking at those two uh, documents that are up because they are quite key to what's going to happen or what can happen in the future. And this is our chance to have a say. And does anyone um, have a specific question for um, Ian today? How about a comment for Ian today? Or um, anyone get anything special? You've wowed them all? They're just... <laughs> so he met the Queen. That wasn't going to be a question, no. Tony. <laughs> uh, but he has also has met lots of other important people. I know. Um, if we uh, look, we, we'll probably start our um, our closing session. Uh, but it might be useful to think about some of the things that perhaps in future uh, we might want to have someone from Tex to talk about, uh, because there's it's an ongoing process and it's. Uh, it's something that we need to be considering in the long term. So if you've got in particular some ideas about things you'd like to hear um, Texa talk more about, please put them on your evaluation sheet or um, think about them for what we're going to do now. Thank you very much, Ian. Really appreciate that. <laughs> and handing over to Cynthia because uh, we're at the very tail end of the day now. Uh, thanks very much. Um, we were going to